Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this interview with Professor Jeffrey Pless on crisis, global sociology and dialogue. Uh, Jeffrey Pless is an FRS, FNRS researcher and professor of sociology at the University of Louvain, Belgium. He is also the current president of the International Sociological Association, ISA. A uh, very glad to have you, Professor Pless. Thank you uh, for giving us the time and welcome back to doing sociology. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for welcoming me back and, and for this opportunity. Yeah, so uh, let me uh, just begin the discussion by asking you, how would you explain what global sociology is? Because you have been someone who has constantly and extensively been writing on it. So how would you explain what, you know, global sociology itself is? This looks like an easy question, but it's actually a difficult one. It's, uh, there's, there's been many articles, many books trying to explain what global sociology is. I think it's difficult to define because it is at the same time a field, a field of research, a research object, a reality, and a project. So it's, um, um, it's a field because it's about um, the sociology of globalization, about the global, and, uh, and sociologists work on that. And not only sociologists, also economists, of course, political scientists, international relations. So it's a field of research. It's also, um, and as a field, it had this heyday, probably in the 1990s, where after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, many sociologists, many, many political scientists and international relations uh, researchers started to talk about globalization. That meant at that time, globalizing the West. Um, so that's when the field was uh, consolidated and, and uh, became very large. It's also an object, of course, globalization and sociology uh, and global sociology, uh, a research of uh, uh, the object of many research, uh, not only, but mostly about the people who, uh, who do sociology of intellectuals, sociology of, uh, of globalization too. And so, as such, we see how sociology itself and global sociology has involved. I would also say that whether we want it or not, global sociology is a reality today because sociologists are always more connected and in, in touch with each other. And in that, when, when some people may talk about deglobalization, the fact that we are in a phase of uh, less globalization, this may be true in terms of economy. Yes, we, have, we may have less international exchanges in, in trade, but for sociology it's not the case because we are increasingly connected. We talk increasingly among sociologists from different continents, so it, it is a reality. I would also say it is a project and definitely it is most probably the project that is at the core of my association, the International Sociological Association. It's a project because we do believe that if sociologists from different continents talk together and work together, we will have a better understanding of, what, of the challenges we face in different countries, different continents, and at the global level. And also, I think that um, the progressive rise of a planetary consciousness is uh, one of the main challenges of our time. And for this challenge, for contributing to the emergence of a planetary consciousness is maybe one of the main tasks of sociology today. I do believe that if sociologists are at the high of the um, mission today, they should also contribute to that, to a better understanding across uh, across borders, among people from different cultural region continents, but also to give the full space for the knowledge and uh, analysis and research um, that comes from sociologists, both in the global north and in the global south. So in, as such, as I said, it's a, it's an object, it's a project, it's a reality, and of course, it's also a field of research. All right, and thank you for that response. So we are talking about crisis, and do you think that there is also some sort of crisis or plural crises that global sociology faces? And if you could talk about this issue with a few examples. Um, actually, I don't think so. Uh, I, I know that many colleagues talk about a crisis of global sociology, I, I disagree on this point. I think on the opposite, global sociology is now going through a very exciting period. It's fascinating to see, to be able to read sociologists from all over the globe. 
and uh, in a way that is very different from the 1990s. When what is true is that I wouldn't say it as a crisis. I would just say that what we mean today by global sociology is very different than what we meant 40 years ago. When the field was consolidated in the 1990s, global sociology uh, came in a very different world. It was at the time uh, a sociology that was that focused on um, mostly on Western societies. It was mostly focused on the interconnectedness, on the social media that had become increasingly important, but today it's just a part of our life. It was also a sociology, global sociology was, was about um, an idea of an ex expansion, expanding most of the West, expanding the economy. Um, it was a period of economic growth everywhere, or in most parts of the world. So it was about expansion. Today, global sociology is about limits. It's about a limited planet. We have to live together on a limited planet. That's very different. But it's also exciting in terms of, of knowledge and in terms of uh, uh, sociology. Also, in the 1990s, and this may, may be seen as a crisis, um, we, most people who wrote about global sociology had the conviction that we would live in an increasingly democratic and tolerant world. That democracy, the democratic model, tolerance would expand all over the world after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet uh, Russia. This is not the case. We see today that uh, globalization and uh, global sociology face increasingly increasing challenges by authoritarian regimes and dictatorship. Sociology is not welcome in many countries. Sociology is challenged there. So this is also a challenge for sociology, but it's also an object of research. How do we research on, on the connection between different uh, authoritarian regimes? How do we study also democracy? It's also still deepening in, in some part of the world and, and has also some new challenges. And, but I would say the main transformation the main change in global sociology in the last 25 years is the rising importance and visibility of researchers from the global south. When I started working on, uh, so on globalization, almost all the authors I read were white men. A few women, but almost all American European researchers. They are still important, and I, I still uh, consider that uh, people like Ulrich Beck, Giddens, Manuel Castells and a few other have really they, they helped us to think the world. But today, global sociology is actually the opposite. Before it was, global sociology was about expanding Western Eurocentric sociology. Today, it's the opposite. It is about challenging Eurocentric sociology. It's about bringing new voices in, different voices in, uh, in the not only in the, in the global south but everywhere. It's about um, a sociology that, is, that may take into consideration some contribution from Europe. From Europe, uh, Chakrabarti had a right word for that. He, called it, uh, he writes about provincializing Europe. It's one part of the world as many others. What we see today, and this is what, why global sociology is so fascinating, so exciting today, is that we discover some scholar from all over all of the world that help us to think of times. Uh, we, we discover some sociologies that have been invisibilized for too long in the global north and mostly in the global south. But also, if you take the case of Du Bois in the US, he was invisibilized because he was a black sociologist. Uh, so it also works in the north, but especially in the south. Today, there are so many brilliant sociologists in India, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, some of them have found their voices, much more than in previous decades. But we also know that there are many others that we need to, to, to read, we need to visibilize. And this is important, not only because we may have a democratic ideal in sociology. We may say, okay, it should be fair that everyone, uh, people from every country have a fair access to diffusion. And this is good. We need sociology from different places of the world. That's like, let's say, uh, democratic ideal. But this is not the main point. The main point is that if we manage to better integrate, to, better in, to fully include sociologists and soci sociological knowledge from different places of the world, 
we just do better sociology. We understand better the challenges we face. If we, if we, if we include not only sociologists situated in the global north. Let me take an example, as you ask me for some examples here. Um, the environment, the limited planet on which we live on. If we, there are so many important, crucial contributions from Latin America, the continent I know a bit better, uh, but also from India, from Africa, things like the Ubuntu, the idea of being together uh, from Africa. But in Latin America, for example, they have this um, very strong idea of uh, connecting uh, the environment, uh, the movement of the climate, about the structure of nature, with the questioning of modernity, with the challenging, challenging of the, this idea of permanent growth. This is something that's now more common in Europe. Uh, the fact that uh, indigenous knowledge is crucial if we want to cope with our climate change and to, if we want to reduce the human impact on, on climate. Likewise, today we see that um, there is just a book out on, um, on environment and the new green consensus. Um, the, from Latin American scholars, they show very well how um, what we see as a consensus in and of about new sources of energy is actually uh, very damaging in the global south. So on every big challenge we have, we always have to, we, we gain a lot in understanding the challenges we face by integrating scholars, knowledge, and actors from the global south. It's not only about better understanding countries in the global south, which is already very important. It's about having a better understanding of the challenges we all face and bring in some alternative, some solutions to it. I see, for example, in India, on the environment, environmental issues, um, Ashish Kotari in Pune, not only in Pune, but in, he's based in Pune, he's doing a fantastic work. We cannot think about a major issue like ecology without bringing in uh, pioneers from India, Vandana Shiva, on ecofeminism, uh, and many other uh, scholars. If we think about global sociology, we cannot do it without Indian scholars like Sujata Patel and many others. So it's, it's not only about, um, I, I think we, we are today in a, in a fantastic era where our disconnectedness are more visible, where there are many more ways to diffuse this kind of knowledge coming from different continents, where we all have an easy, easier access to it. And this is fantastic because it brings us so many different tools and perspective, perspectives to think our world. In this perspective, that, that's also why I, I don't see it at all. I don't leave it as a crisis of global sociology. I would see some crisis in the world, but I would see on the opposite. It is an exciting, it's a fantastic period. It's a great period to be a sociologist because our times are challenging, but also because we are a much more global community as we used to be, a, a much different one. Of course, we still have a long way to go. It's still hierarchical. We still have to uh, work a lot to better diffuse, to better include sociologists from all continents. But at the same time, we can already uh, take advantage of what has been done in the previous years and read and have access and talk with our colleagues from all continents. That's fascinating. And I think that uh, it's just, uh, we learn so much. And it's, it's, that's why it's so great to be a sociologist. And I think it's a role of our association, the ISA, to bring sociologists from different continents together. Right. Again, thank you for that response and explaining it so lucidly. So uh, I would want to know how, you know, you see the role of sociologists and professional bodies in this exciting prospect or the period that you call it. Because if you're not tackling a crisis, but we are still dealing with some sort of, you know, exciting moment. So what would be the role of professional mm -hmm. bodies like, let's say, ISA, since you are the president now in this moment for global sociology? Definitely. As I said, we, I don't see a crisis of global sociology as the transformations of global sociology. But yes, you're right to say that sociology has to, the world, the world is facing a series of, series of crises. We can discuss about how much it is a crisis because as far as I know, the world has whole, always been in crisis ever since the, the, the beginning, beginning of modernity. So we have, as sociologists, we have to co contribute to a better understanding of the world in which we live today, of the challenges we face, and hopefully with a, um, 
a more global consciousness. The fact that uh, every continent, every country will not only think about itself, but also think the, the issues globally, which is indispensable for all of us. So in this, I do believe that the ISA, the International Sociological Association, is, is not the aim, it's our tool. It's a better tool we have to promote a dialogue among sociologists from different continents, to make, to provide opportunities for them to meet in person. It's important, it's not only online. Online is very important. Also sometimes meeting in person is important. And it's also um, in our publication, in our social media, that also increasingly important in building a global community of scholars, of sociologists, and in the way we develop it too. We have to, it's important to point to this global sociology to, exp to, to, to say that sociology cannot be, should not be only national or regional, it has it also to um, impulse to foster a global dialogue. And I would say, uh, so we, that's what we do concretely at the ISA. We try to, for example, we are very active in trying to get more authors, more, more researchers from the Global South in our journals. And we develop practical help for that. Because too often, it's not about the quality of the research, it's about the quality of the way it is presented. Too often, the uh, sociologists in the Global South, they haven't um, learned the standards, the practical standards of research, of, of publication, which is actually, it's not about the quality of research, it's about the quality of how you write it. And that's why we need to offer some help. That's what we do with our journals. Likewise, I think that we do very importantly with Global Dialogue, or magazine, which is uh, published in many, 17 languages, including Hindi. And um, that's important. We have short articles available to a wider audience. This is all built a global community of sociologists. And I think that in this perspective, we, we should see everywhere when the ISA can be a tool to strengthen this connectiveness, this globality, and to, to open dialogue among sociologists. Now, this is seen as some, what is really important here is for us also to set the infrastructure, to propose Congress, a forum, Hopefully, I will it would be my, one of my dreams to have a big forum, a big congress in India again in the next um, in the next decade. Hopefully, it's not always easy with the current uh, government, national government at least, but there are some regional government that may help a lot. This would be important. But uh, so infrastructure is important. Reading, listening to each other is also very important. And I would say that the ISA is also not only to provide infrastructure, but also to support to develop to um, a kind of philosophy, a philosophy of intercultural dialogue. Sociologists should be much more open to knowledge that takes different forms from different continents. We should uh, transform the canons of our disciplines. We should not, we should read less. Uh, all sociologists from global north and more sociologists from different parts of the world. That's really important in the way we teach sociology. But we should also know that if we want to develop a global sociology, the personal dimension is important. Um, we need to meet each other, to, to take time to understand each other, to support each other, and to understand that everyone speaks from a different stance, a different perspective, to be differently for Europeans, for North Americans, be more humble, uh, be, be, be less, um, uh, not humble, be be less assertive about one's own knowledge and be more open to challenging, to questioning. This is really important. And um, especially bringing in a dialogue with sociologists from different continents. This requires also this kind of personal meetings, which are important. But also I would say that providing materials in different ways, of course, books, articles, podcasts, and uh, to make sure that people have access to different sociology, this is also very important.
Right. So uh, we were talking about the global south and then, of course, the ISA also trying to do more in terms of inclusion in journals and things like that. So uh, do you think that now that we have a decolonial turn, which is being talked about globally, that also uh, is important for uh, sociology and global sociology to consider, uh, particularly if we are talking about inclusivity? And, you know, how do you see decolonization playing an important role in this? The decolonial perspective, I would say post-colonial perspective, decolonial perspective, some part of a feminist critical perspective, um, and other trends are crucial. These are the most important transformation in sociology in the, this has been in the past two or three decades. Uh, it's crucial uh, and it's widely, it's widely integrated in part of sociology. As I said, it has transformed the way we see global sociology. No one should be able to talk about global sociology like in the 1990s, because at that time, it was, global sociology was expanding the West, Western sociology, Eurocentric sociology. Today, thanks to the decolonial perspective, post-colonial perspective, we see global sociology as challenging this Western dominant perspective on the world and on sociology. So this has been a big part of the work has been done theoretically, theoretically. But how do we implement this perspective in each and every field of sociology? Would we open it, would we open the field of sociology of education, of aging, of youth, of um, social movements, clinical sociology? How do we work together? This is still really a challenge we, we face. We have to, uh, not only about, it's not about decolonization, decolonization it's about this meeting to bring together different perspectives. This is really not easy to implement. So it's, um, I would say it's a permanent struggle, even more for people like me, European, sociologists, men, of course, I have to all, always to question myself to see how much, how much Eurocentric my perspective is, how to better include perspective from Latin America, from India, from different continents. And this is something that will never end, hopefully. It's a permanent challenge. It's not that you say, okay, we have a theory about the colonial, the colonial perspective, no. The challenge is to implement it concretely in your own research. I would say not only in your own research, in your teaching, of course, but also in your way, way of being. It's about, it, it challenges you, not only as a sociologist, it challenges you as a person, as a human being. You cannot be the same person after, uh, after reading, after trying to integrate decolonial perspectives. So that's a permanent challenge. But, um, I would say, as I, as I said it a bit earlier, that um, the role of the Global South is uh, to include the Global South, as I said, it's not only about democratizing sociology, it is mostly about uh, bringing insightful perspective to understand the world, to bring new solutions to some challenges. This is really crucial. And here we see that for many of the challenges we face globally, many solutions, many alternatives have been implemented in the global south. Of course, it's very true about the climate. Climate change is arguably the main challenge we face in this uh, century. Well, on climate change, we know that there are many small peasants in India with the Via Campesina network, in, uh, in Korea, KCTU, TU, or in Latin America, many small farmers who develop an agriculture, who produce food, in a different way, because it's they are small scale farm, and um, they what they do is to develop a different way that is much better, much more respectful for nature. So there are plenty of solutions. If you the way to tackle poverty, the way to uh, uh, the way to talk about inequalities, these are issues that we have to discuss, starting with perspectives that comes from the global south and not any global south, but with the actors of the global south. No, the challenge is to avoid essentialization. I say global south, but actually we should reject this term in the global south. It's also a matter of, um, of class and distinction inequalities. In the global south, there are obviously people in sociology, as in any other disciplines, who reproduce the global north even more than colleagues from the global north. 
there are people in the global south who teach a strategy only based on uh, on perspective of knowledge from the global north, especially the case in Latin America. So it's not about it's not the geographical south. We have to think about uh, a perspective on knowledge that is built much more with the actors and this this challenges the dominant perspective. But this happens also in the global north, and all the uh, we should not say that because it comes from the global south, it's always progressive, it's always uh, good. No, not at all. You can see it in terms of uh, knowledge, politics, and culture in India, or in many parts of uh, Latin America. There are reactionary movements, and there are forms of knowledge that are not compatible with uh, democratic understanding, and it's not compatible with democracy, actually. Uh, and, and so, in this perspective, we should be careful not to idealize any uh, the global south, nor any kind of knowledge from the global south. We, uh, we should build on innovative knowledge to help us to face global challenges, but we should stop uh, saying that all the sociology from the global north is bad and all sociology from the global south is progressive. That's not the case. And um, the challenge is much more about a different sociology that is able to understand a world and hopefully to contribute to solutions for uh, a better, less unequal, more democratic, and sustainable world. That's our mission. And uh, all sociologists are not going that direction in the global south and, not, and in the global north. That's, so we should, hopefully someone will come up with a better term. Global south is not the best one. It's about a sociology that cares about the people from below. It's about a sociology that uh, is open and tolerant. Tolerance is very important. Uh, and so today, when we when we see the regression we have in our world about tolerance, about uh, um, about democracy, about fake news, we have such an important role to play. And there are sociologists from all continents who try to play this role. Um, at the same time, I also acknowledge that today we have to learn probably much more than in the past from the global south or from this region. And that's an important point that you raise about the global south. And I was also wondering if you see any kind of relationship between global sociology and public sociology and, you know, what uh, the internet or the digital can do in bridging gaps, because we are also talking about bridging gaps, isn't it? So if, you know, you think that these are ways in which we can uh, think about global sociology in better terms. As you know, um, global sociology is a term that was um, diffused by one of my predecessors, a fantastic, one of the most important president of the International Sociological Association, Michael Barrowwood. That's uh, a term that was very helpful in the US, particularly. I wouldn't say it in, in, in Latin America, because in Latin America, public sociology is it's just sociology. It's just so common. Almost every sociologist contributes to the um, newspapers to public debate. So that's in included in our way of being sociologists in Latin America. The same in France and Belgium. Um, so public sociology, but it's important also to rem to remind it for Michael Borowold. Public sociology is not all sociology. It's a part of sociology and we need the other form of sociology too. We need academic sociology. We need expert sociology and policy sociology. We need poli uh, sociologists are able to to help um, po policymakers to do better policies. We need a sociology that uh, is also written in journals for, the, for academics, for, for scholars. So we need the four forms of sociology. I would say, I would say it's the same for global sociology. We need global sociology as a, an academic field. We need it in, we have good journals, globalizations, and a few others. Uh, so that's really important. We have to keep this academic part of global sociology. We need a global sociology able to bring a different perspective, less national, uh, to, to the UN, to uh, the, the big uh, international institutions. Hopefully, sociologists will be more present there. It is not so much the case today. We need uh, critical sociology, of course, uh, to, that is able to criticized to, uh, to assert some critical perspective on today's globalization. This is uh, today the way we live together, the way we destroy nature. 
this is really important, this third sociology, the critical sociology, more academic, very often. But we also need a global public sociology. This is crucial because, um, and this is a real challenge. I dedicated much of my time in the past um, eight years trying to bring to, to trying to make, um, to bring together scholars from different continents, for example, in different books. Together with my friends and colleague, um, Bruno Brigel, we published four books on um, with short chapters um, by sociologists from different countries, different continents. Now, it is much more challenging that we think, and you probably know it by doing this uh, podcast. When you want to, when you want a sociologist, for example, from Indonesia, to be able to explain the issues of sociology, the public issues in his country, in her country, to a global audience, it's not only about translating the words, it's about giving the, the reader the tools to understand the person there, to understand the basis of Indonesia, and for the Indian, Indonesian author to be able to, to explain what happens in her country in different terms, available for um, that the global audience could, is able to read and understand. So it's really a big work, work of translation, not only in terms of language, but translation here. And this is really important. Why? Because it is by bringing all this knowledge, uh, by making people more aware of what's, what is happening in different countries, in different continents, that we may contribute to, uh, to increasing uh, global consciousness, which is a core mission of our discipline today. And this cannot be done only in scholar journal. It has to be done in terms of public sociology. A sociology is accessible to a wide range of citizens. I wouldn't say to everyone because it's true that it remains we, we are mostly the, we mostly address people with a, let's say a fair level of education. But hopefully we, we have to go beyond the audience of sociologists, we have to go beyond the audience of uh, scholars and uh, people who have a university diploma. We have to explain, we have to be able to collectively to explain challenges in life in different countries to a wide, large audience. That's really difficult. We have to dedicate time to that. And uh, we have to know that this is a collective effort. We have to help sociologists from different countries, from different continents to publish uh, public sociology in, uh, in different countries. Right. I have a last question, which is, of course, a very challenging one for all of us. But uh, there is this question of employment and precarity associated with a lot of social sciences and humanities disciplines at the moment. So, uh, and that is also a question that particularly young sociologists in India and many other countries are, you know, facing. So, what do you think about the role of sociology and uh, of professional bodies as well in you know handling this issue of employment and precarity because when we are talking about the possibilities of growth and progress of a discipline we also cannot ignore you know the job prospect side yeah so here's a tricky question both uh, in terms of um, the reality there's different in, in different continents uh, but also, well, I'll come back to that, and uh, um, the, the place of young sociologists here. So, a problem we face today is uh, the precarization, not only of um, of every jobs, actually, but also in university. Even the people who have a fixed job now today, there are too many standards of they have they have to publish a lot in some journals in English most of the time. They is, is, uh, they don't value the other languages or other, um, for example, uh, the language of their own countries is very often uh, undervalued. So that's a, a precarization because you have to, every year, every two years you are evaluated and you have to have a sufficient amount of points of, uh, of uh, publication. Of, uh, and that's, that's really, it's, it's, it's not a good way to produce good critical sociology because to conduct research in social sciences takes time. It takes far more time if you want to do qualitative research. It takes more time than in a hard science. A biologist may go in a laboratory and find some evidence. If you want to understand an issue, you need some time to go to the field work, to talk to people. And what I see in an increasing number of, number of countries is that there's not time, even during a PhD, to make good field work, to go to talk to people, to read, 
and to, to get a bit lost in your field work because you don't know exactly what you will find before you start. So we need to defend time for field work, time for uh, the PhD students. Then, in increasing part of the world, we also have extended a very precarious period today, which is post-doctorate. Uh, so postdoc, a really precarious position, two or three years, which are good because you are able to do your own research, but then <clears throat> difficult to see the perspective on the job market. Um, what happened today is that, and that's something very good, today there are far more doctors in sociology than used to be 30 years ago, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. So it's really good that we see in Latin America, it's very clear, in many other continents too, in Europe for sure, in, in the US, I'm not that sure. But um, there are far more doctors in sociology today. And of course, all of them will not find a job in the academia. But we have to defend also the fact that it's important to have qualified doctors in sociology who work in international institutions, in national institutions, in the states, uh, in uh, the state level uh, to develop policies. I think a PhD in sociology is very valuable for that. So this, we should value much more this kind of professional sociology that implements policy, that develop policies. That's also a role of, um, uh, for a PhD, uh, for sociologists with a PhD. That's really important. At the same time, I think we, we have a precarization of all sectors of society, of work, and that affects us more today, even more today, because it's, uh, it comes at the latest stage of life. Today, the practicization comes very often after your PhD, after some years of postdoctorate. So you are there in your 30, often with a family, and it's so difficult to find a work, a job. This reproduces inequalities, because at the end, many of the people who are able to remain in a job market is be because they need some support from their family. And so if your family is well off, you may remain more time in the job market. So this is really challenging for sociology. And it produces uh, the fact that we have, we may uh, discard many valuable sociologists just because of that. And, and that's really, as you said, a challenge for disciplines, I would, for our discipline. I would add, add another issue. It's not only about precarization. It's that today, sociology is less visible in many countries and more importantly, is attacked directly or indirectly in many countries. And here we need to come together, and that's why other nationalization is a very important goal, to defend sociology, to, to defend sociology when, for example, uh, in, te in public debates, I know, let me tell you about two cases and nationalizations. In Colombia, five years ago, the vice president talked about uh, sociology as a useless discipline, that young people should not uh, go to sociology. So immediately, the Colombian Association of Sociology reacted they met with a vice president two or three days afterwards, explained how sociology is important. And within a week, the vice president uh, said some official excuses and explained how sociology was important. So we have to defend how sociology is important in the academia, for policy, in society, for civil society. We also have to, uh, uh, so another case is in France. In France, a former, former president Sarkozy also explained sociology, psychology, these disciplines will lead you to unemployment. The French Sociological Society made a survey and showed that sociologists are actually very well in terms of job market, that most sociologists find a job within one year after their graduation. So there are many false ideas about sociology that we have to deconstruct. It is useful that the students we train as sociologists are good sociologists, but also good in many other fields because we have a kind of complex perspective of society. So that's something we have to do. At the same time, and the more difficult part of the job is, uh, and we have also to, to struggle and to explain how um, violent this increasingly pre uh, precarious society is for individual people. That is uh, the, the job market they offer today in sociology and in the broad society is so difficult to live in. It's a, it brings all the responsibility of individuals, while the problem is collective. We know that that's the way it works in the neoliberal society. So we have to, we have good analysis, we have to diffuse it, we have to keep working on, uh, on the labor market, on labor, on what, what uh, work means in people's life. And there, it's an expanding field today. 
to see this platform economy, how uh, precarious uh, jobs have become. So that's really important. And I would say a third thing that's even more complicated is the fact that sociology is under attack by many governments today for different reasons. Some because uh, they are neoliberals, but also many because sociology sociologists will always be a critical voices, critical voices uh, when it comes to authoritarianism, in, intolerance. Sociologists are explain the world in different way. Sociology, sociology don't uh, refuse to reduce the world to identity, refuse to reduce the world to uh, one against the, the other. Sociologists refuse to blame all the um, to, to blame the individual for everything. We refuse to say that if you are without a job, if you are precarious, it's only your fault. No, that's a job market, a society, that's the way society is organized. We refuse to say that if you are in the Muslim or Christian, you should oppose you, each other. Of course not. We develop a different perspective. So this is in the world of the 21st century, in particular in this decade. This is not welcome by all the governments. And very clearly, we see how, from the very early stage, uh, sociologists are uh, on a threat because of that. I see it, uh, I remember some years ago in India, every time some sociologists wanted to, in Pune, wanted to uh, show, uh, to screen a movie and to have some debates about a movie, nationalist activists came and, uh, and made sure that this activity could not take place. So, yes, sociology, as its substance, is opposed to forms of intolerance. And this is also why uh, some governments are less in favor of uh, sociology. Well, uh, thank you so much, Professor Flairs, for very patiently answering my questions and uh, talking to uh, us about global sociology, uh, exciting prospects, uh, impending crisis or not, if I may say so, from the discussion that we have had. And of course, uh, dialogue and bridge building. Thank you once again for, you know, giving us the time. Thank you so much, not only for welcoming me this second and longer discussion, but also for all the work you do. I think really doing sociology is a fantastic channel. It's uh, so professional, uh, professionally made in terms of podcasts. I really do hope you will find a diffusion in India, but also much beyond, because the work you do is also to build a bridge between Indian sociologists and Indian uh, actors with uh, global sociology. So we have to work together on that, and I do hope that doing sociology will find an open and, and broader place in the ISA. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you.